Tonight, Oscar Pistorius tells the court of the dramatic events of the night he shot his girlfriend. Before Neil Todd fired four shots at the door. The athlete breaks down uncontrollably as he describes the moment he realised what he'd done. <laughs> she wasn't breathing. Well, good evening from here in the High Court in Pretoria, where Oscar Pistorius has been talking in person today for the first time about the night that he relived the shooting of his girlfriend, Riva Steenkamp. The Olympian said that he believed he was defending his home from a burglar, from an intruder, when he fired his gun four times through a locked toilet door. He said it was only after he broke down that door with his cricket bat that he discovered he had shot not an intruder, but his girlfriend, Lisa Holland, reports on another extraordinary day in this courtroom. Fourteen months after shooting his girlfriend dead, Oscar Pistorius gave a packed courtroom his account of that fateful night. The athlete would build up to an emotional breakdown, which would cut short day 17 of the trial. He said the couple had dinner and went to bed about 8 o'clock in the evening at his home in Pretoria. He agreed for his evidence to be heard but not seen. I walked behind Reva where she came in the room and I closed the bedroom door and I locked the bedroom door as I do every night and I put the cricket bat between the sunglasses cabinets and the door. Um, if you lay the bat down in that gap the bat's about, about two centimetres short of being at the door. And the reason I put it with there was because the lock mechanism on the door wasn't very strong. In spite of his fear of crime, he said his alarm system wasn't working properly. Does the house have an alarm system? Uh, the alarm system doesn't have any door monitors. Um, but... Uh, the outside um, sensors are battery operated. They're not. Um, they don't work with 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 wiring. Um, so when they had painted the house in 2010, they had taken all the the eyes off the outside walls, and um, they had painted the home. And they were in the process of repainting now. So there were troubles with the alarm. Oscar Pistorius said he had taken off his prosthetic legs once he reached the bedroom. Lady, my apologies for the more informal dress code. It's not because of disrespect, but it's to demonstrate what's coming. In a dramatic moment, defence lawyer Barry Rue asked Oscar Pistorius to take off his prosthetics in court. Mr Pistorius, I, if I may ask you, but don't give evidence from the door because of the, the recordings, but if you would mind to go to the door and stand next to the door to get some idea about your length with your prosthesis on. Oscar Pistorius, now wearing shorts, was asked to stand next to the bathroom door he had fired through. Would you now take your prosthesis off and stand next to the door? The courtroom would see him not as a powerful athlete, but how he was when he killed his girlfriend on his stumps. Reva's mother, June, and members of Oscar's own family listened as he emotionally recounted the details of the early hours of Valentine's Day last year. He says he woke up. Reva, who was in bed next to him, would speak her last words. Um, I woke up, my lady, in the early hours of the 14th of February. It was extremely warm in my room. Um, I sat up in bed. I, Reva was, Reva was still awake, or she was obviously not sleeping. Um, she rolled over to me and she said, "Can't you sleep, my baba?" And I said, "No, I can't." And I got out on my side of the bed. I walked around the bed, uh, foot of the bed. I was holding onto the foot of the bed with my left hand. I got to the the fans where the fans were. I took the small fan, the floor fan. 
I placed it um, pretty much just inside the room. I then proceeded to close the sliding doors and lock them. I then drew the curtains. Because uh, at this point that I heard a window open in the bathroom, it sounded like a, the window sliding open. And then I could hear the window hit the frame uh, as if it had slid to a point where it can't slide anymore. What, what did you think at the time, Mr Pistorius? My lady, that's the moment that everything changed. I thought that there was a burglar that was gaining entry into my home. I was, um, was on the side of the room where you'd first have to cross the passage which leads to the, which leads to the bathroom. I think initially I just froze. I didn't really know what to do. I'd heard this noise. I interpreted it as being somebody was climbing into the bathroom. There's no door between the bathroom and my room. It's all one. There's a passageway, but there's no door. There's a toilet door, but there's no barrier between me and the bathroom. It's it's one one room. I immediately thought that um, somebody if they were at the window to where the passage, entrance of the passage was, could be four, three, four meters. They could be there at any moment. And the first, the first thing that ran through my mind was that I needed to arm myself, that I needed to protect Reva and I, that I needed to get my gun. Then um, um, I was looking down the passage. I was scared that the person was going to come out or people were going to come out at that point. I, I rushed as quick as I could. I couldn't see anything in the room. So I ran with my hand out in front of me, um, at times touching the floor. And then when I got to my bed, I made my way along the side of my bed. Um, I grabbed my, my firearm from underneath the bed and... It had a canvas holster on it. I immediately took it out the holster. Um, at that point, I wanted to just put myself between, get back to where the passage was so that I could put myself between the person that had gained access to my house and Reva. When I got just before the passage wall, I remember slowing down because I was scared that at that point this person, during the time that I'd got from, uh, that I'd left the amp to where I got my firearm, could have possibly already been uh, in the passage, in the closet passage. So I, I slowed down and I had my firearm extended in front of me. If I meant Just as I, just as I left my bed. Um, I whispered for Eva to get down and phone the police. Um, I, I, as I entered where the passenger pass, passage passage is, where the closet is to the where I entered the passage. Uh, where the closet is to the um, to the bathroom. Um, it was at that point that I was just overcome with fear and I started screaming and shouting for the burglar or the intruders to get out of my house. I shouted for Reva to get out on the floor. I shouted for her to phone the police. I screamed at the people, the persons to get out us. Um, slowly made my way down the passage <coughs> constantly aware that this threat these people or persons could come at me at any time I didn't have my legs on
And um, just before I got to the wall of the, like where the tile starts in the bathroom, I stopped shouting because I was worried that if I shot, the person would know exactly where I was. If I put my head around the corner that I could get shot. Um, just before I got to the just before I got to the passage of the <coughs> of the bathroom I heard a door slam which could have only been the toilet door. I couldn't see into the bathroom at this point, but I could hear the door slam and for me it confirmed that there was a person or people inside the toilet or inside the bathroom at that time. Welcome back to the courtroom in Pretoria and it's here that Oscar Pistorius has been giving evidence in this witness box for a second dramatic and emotional day and the athlete has been telling of that fateful night that he armed himself with his pistol and went to the bathroom after he heard a noise and thought it was an intruder. He went on to describe the dramatic moments that followed. As I slowly peered into the bathroom I could see that the window was open, saw that there wasn't anybody around the corner waiting to attack me. I retreated a little bit, maybe a step or two back, still with my hand against the walls. I slid my back and my shoulder um, to help me balance. At this point I started screaming again for Reva to phone the police. Um, I wasn't sure where to point the firearm. I had it pointed at the toilet, but my eyes were going between the window and the toilet. I stood there for some time. Not sure how long. I wasn't sure if somebody was going to come out of the toilet to attack me. I wasn't sure if someone was going to come up the ladder and point a firearm in the house and start shooting. Um, so I just stayed where I was and I kept on screaming and, um, and then I heard a noise from inside the toilet um, what I perceived to be somebody coming out of the toilet before I knew it I would fired four shots at the door my ears were ringing I couldn't hear anything so I shouted, I kept on shouting for Reva to phone the police. I was still scared to retreat because I wasn't sure if there was somebody on the ladder. I wasn't sure if the, there was somebody in the toilet. I don't know. Um, I don't know how long I, sta I stood there for. I shouted for Reva. That... Um, at some point I decided to to walk back to the room because I couldn't hear anything, my ears were ringing, I couldn't hear if there was a response or not. I didn't have the phone on me. I walked with my hand out uh, on the left hand cupboards with my pistol still, still raised. I kept on shouting for Reva. Um, I didn't hear anything. At this point it hadn't occurred to me uh, yet that it could be Reva in the bathroom. I still thought that there would be intruders that were possibly in the toilet or in on the ladder outside the house. I retreated back to a um, point where I got to the corner of the bed. I put my hand out on the bed and I tried to lift myself up whilst talking to Reva. No one responded to me. At that point I lifted myself up onto the bed and I placed my hand back to the right hand side of the bed and I looked, um, I, I felt if Reva was there and I couldn't feel anything. The first thing I thought was maybe that she got down onto the floor. Like I told her to, maybe she was just scared. I can't remember what I said but I was, I was trying to talk out to her and I kept my firearm the whole time I moved along the bed. I think it was at, um, at that point, my lady, that, the, that it first um, dawned upon me that it could be Reva that was in the, 
in the bathroom or in the toilet. I jumped out off the other side of the bed and I ran my hand along the curtains to see that she wasn't hiding behind the curtain. I felt around and made my way back up the passage. I still had my firearm in front of me. At this point I was mixed with emotions. I didn't know if... I didn't want to believe that it could be Reva inside the toilet. I was still scared that maybe somebody was coming in to attack me or us. I made my way back to inside the inside the bathroom and I walked up to the up to the bathroom door. I tried to grab the handle and rip open the door, push the door open and it was locked. For the first time I turned around uh, with my back facing the bathroom. I ran back to the room. Um, I opened the curtains. I shouted from the balcony, I opened the doors and I shouted from the balcony for help. I screamed help, help, help. I screamed for somebody to help me. And then um, I, put my prosthetic, I put my prosthetic legs on. I ran as fast as I could back to the bathroom. I ran into the door. It didn't move at all. I leaned back and I tried to kick the door. And nothing happened. I was, I was just panicked at this point. I didn't really know what to make or what to do. Um, I ran back to the bedroom where the cricket bat was between the cabinet and the door. Were you screaming at that stage? I, I was screaming and shouting the whole time, crying out. So I was. I don't think I've ever screamed like that or cried like that or screamed or. I was crying out for the Lord to help me. I was crying out for Riva. I was screaming. I don't know what to do. I ran back to, ran straight back to the bathroom door. I placed my fire. I don't remember, but I must have placed my firearm on the carpet in the bathroom. I ran straight up to the door and I started uh, hitting it. So I don't. Um, I think I hit it three times. Uh, the first time I hit the tire, I remember hitting, um, I hit the frame of the door and the <laughs> shock in my hands, I, so I swung again and it hits a small piece open and at that point all I wanted to do was just look inside to see if it was Riva and then I then hit the door, um, I think I hit the door three times and there was a big uh, plank, I grabbed it with my hands and I threw it out into the bathroom. I leant over the middle partition. I tried to open the door from the inside, but there was no key in the door. And I leant over the middle partition of the door and I saw the key was on the floor at that point. All I wanted to do was just climb into the toilet over the middle part of the door. I, um, Whilst I leant over the partition to get in, I saw the key, so I took it and I unlocked the door and I flung the door open and I threw it open. And I sat over Reva and I cried. And um, I don't know, I don't know how long... <coughs> I don't know how long I was there for. <laughs> she wasn't breathing. <laughs> <laughs> what an extraordinary day it's been. Uh, a day of legal theatre and drama, really, and first thing that got everybody locked on this particular door, this famous toilet door now, was the moment that Mr. Rue asked Oscar Pistorius, his client, to show them what he was like on his stumps. He was asked, first of all, to sort of stand up against the door to show his height when he's wearing his prosthesis. I think he's slightly shorter than me. Uh, and then he was asked to remove his prosthesis. So he walked over to this seat, sat down, spent a few seconds unstrapping uh, his, his legs, and then he took the, you can see it's not a very long walk, about three strides maybe, 
And in that time, he seemed to rock slightly. His gait definitely wasn't steady, and he's already testified that he finds it uncomfortable to walk on his left stump. And then he pulled himself up again, and this time his head height reached just above the door. And I was struck by how out of proportion he looked, how chunky his upper body was, and yet he looked like a child because he was suddenly diminished in stature. Uh, and he, he looked very embarrassed, to be honest. How are they going to proceed, though? Because at the moment, he seems to be struggling to hold himself together to get through, and this is under the guidance of his own counsel. We always knew, we always knew from what we saw in court during the state's case, that it was going to be very difficult for him to testify. I was very surprised at the extent uh, that he becomes emotional, at the extent of how difficult it has become for him. Um, I'm trying to read the body language of Harry Nell, and I can tell you now there's not going to be any punches hold back. Uh, his demeanor yesterday when the court had to be adjourned because Oscar was tired, uh, the tone of voice of Barry Rue, his whole demeanor, my lady, my client is tired, we want to stand down, that whole sympathy card that became, with the greatest of respect, slightly irritating at some stage. I could see from Harry Nell's body language that he's becoming irritated, he's becoming agitated, and I think becoming fired up uh, for what is lying ahead. After the performance, and I say this also again with the greatest of respect, uh, of Oscar Pistorius today in court, much, much is going to depend on cross-examination and effective cross-examination to test this version. Renier, Alex, thanks for uh, taking us through the events today. Uh, another amazing day in court and of course we'll be here live for you from 8.30 tomorrow morning as the new day dawns here in this courtroom in Pretoria. See who turns up, see what sort of shape they're in, see how this trial progresses and of course if you miss it during the day, special programme every night, 9.30 weekday nights on Sky News.